Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God is in the habit of calling. This is the first of many call stories in scripture, and it stands out because it is, well, vague. It's so open-ended. The Lord instructs Abram and Sarai to pack up their lives to leave everything they love and to set out for a distant land. But beyond that, there is no objective. No task to be accomplished, no action plan laid out. This is not like Moses, whom God sends to Pharaoh specifically to bring the Israelites out of Egypt and into a land flowing with milk and honey. Or the prophet Jeremiah, who is called to speak the words that God puts into his mouth. Or the disciples, whom Christ summons saying, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. The call of Abram and Sarai is different. They are simply sent, with a promise that will sustain them on their journey and a command to guide their way. Go, says the Lord, and I will bless you, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. God does not give Abram and Sarai a specific goal to achieve, but their mission is no less important. God claims this couple for a life of blessing and calls them to bear this blessing to the world. Through Abram and Sarai, all the families of the earth will experience the wholeness that God intended in calling the world into being. And this is our calling as well, for we are members of the community that began with Abram and Sarai's faithful response. Generations later, God still claims and calls each of us with that same promise, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. Living as a blessing may seem a vague and a never-ending call, just as overwhelming for us as it must have seemed to our ancestors. We, we know we are called to work for the well-being of all, for justice, for human dignity. Some of us live out that calling, actively engaged in ministries of blessing, giving of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Some of us are still sorting out the pulls on our own hearts, discerning how our gifts intersect with the world's great need. And there is grace in this variety of responses, for it means we can all follow the faithful footsteps of Abram or Sarai, each in our own way and in our own time. But in our quest, to taste God's blessing for ourselves and to share this blessing with others, we have found our way to Westminster Presbyterian Church. For some of us, this community has been the starting point on our journeys of faith. 
For others, it's the place we've chosen to pitch our tents and dwell on holy ground. And as we open ourselves to the Spirit of God moving in and through this community, many of us have heard the voice that claims and calls. We've encountered the Holy One in worship through opportunities to grow in faith and in service within and beyond these walls. And so we encourage one another sharing our stories and sharing the blessings that have found us. You may have been exposed to the prelude at some point in your education, the magnum opus of William Wordsworth, printed circa 1850. It was written and edited over years. In one favorite section, I feel resonance with his complete happiness as he states, Ah, dear friends, but to the brim my heart was full. I made no vows, but vows were then made for me. Bond unknown to me was given, that I should be else sinning greatly, a dedicated spirit, and on I walk in blessedness, which even yet remains. It is easy to walk into this church and feel blessed. First, it is just a beautiful place. The gray sparkling stone, the buffed woods, and the richly colored stained glass windows are just a few of the things we notice quite immediately. But then beyond the stately pulpit, the pristine sanctuary, the crosses, pictures, and flowers, there are the people, the wonderful people. The ones that run this place keep it beautiful and are committed to it and to us day in and day out. And even as I come in with my own personal concerns, everyone is friendly, helping me meet my needs of the moment. I don't feel like an imposition. I feel like I belong. I have friends here, real friends, friends who bring meaning to my life. For nearly 20 years, I've been walking in these doors. Steve and I were early in our marriage and looking for a church we both could feel comfortable and at home in. He was a little more of a seeker, and as I look back on it, I was just opening to the broader possibilities of my spiritual journey. How were we to know of vows, bonds, and the dedication we'd feel to this place? We settled in here because of the things most of us likely enjoy about Westminster, but we've stayed because we never felt we had to give up a piece of ourselves to belong. My work is as an executive coach and leadership consultant. Learning, leadership, and organizational development are my areas of specialty. I've always been curious about people and how we get along in our worlds. I have been able to contribute to Westminster most from these skill sets, assisting with the discernment team as an elder, with Christian education, teaming with Steve to provide poetry, dreams, and reflections workshops, expanding my horizons with the Israel-Palestine trip, working with staff to process a former associate pastor Chad Miller's death and presenting to the Stephen ministers on the wounded <coughs> excuse me wounded healer archetype to name a few i must confess that greg asked me to do one of these lay sermons last year and i said no imagine saying no to greg <laughs> well he gave me grace in the short run but as you can see he's persistent <laughs> In my defense, last year I was beginning the writing of my second book. It was just published last week, so no more excuses. Here I am. <laughs> it is about the wounded healer archetype, which is the idea of the necessity of both the understanding of being wounded, the inner work we have to do to manage these hurts, disappointments, fears, and the capacity of the healer, the one who brings solace, care, and companionship. Without experience in both aspects, we are not very useful in our work with others. My focus has been on bringing this idea to executive coaches. We don't think of executives as wounded, but we're all wounded in some way. The point is that I got to try out this work, uh, the concepts of this work right here 
and church. These are holy issues. We don't tend to talk about spiritual things in the workplace, but we can. I have found a way to do it through the work of Swiss psychologist Carl Jung. Jung provided us an understanding of individuation, or how we fulfill our unique destiny, noting that the first half of life is about establishing ourselves, getting an education, a job, having children, buying a house, and achieving all the things that enable us to meet our expectations for ourselves, and quite often society's expectations for us. Once we feel established, Jung said it was then, if we were inclined to pay attention, to be conscious, that we entered the second half of life the meaning-making phase. In this phase, it is not so much about what we need, but what brings feelings of fulfillment. We get there by entertaining all of the emotions and experiences that come our way. Steve's collaboration between the Community for Integrative Learning and the Church, bringing speakers like Philip Newell, Marcus Borg, Eben Alexander, Matthew Fox, have all helped me grow emotionally and spiritually, helped us grow with this community. Poet Rainier Maria Rilke writes, I want to unfold. I don't want to stay folded anywhere, because where I am folded, I am a lie. And I want to grasp, have my grasp of things true before you. I want to describe myself like a painting that I looked at closely for a long time. I have been unfolding at Westminster, and I thank you for the opportunity to describe myself to some degree. I am grateful for being able to find blessedness, to learn how to pray, and to navigate into my second half of life in a safe and kind container here at Westminster with you. Welcome to the thorn between the two roses. <laughs> the Tigers of Clemson University are the reigning national champions of college football. <laughs> like many schools, Clemson has a number of wonderful traditions. One of them centers around a large stone that was retrieved from Death Valley by a fan and presented to then coach Frank Howard back in the 1960s. Today, Howard's Rock sits at the top of a hill in the east end zone in the football stadium. On game day, players rub the rock, run down the hill onto the field while the band plays and the stadium erupts. So why am I talking about an old rock and a football team? <laughs> For me, Westminster is like Howard's Rock. It's a central place in my life where I can come each week catch my breath, see some friends, and hear a message that reminds me of what's important in life. Counting my blessings, sharing them with others, and being encouraged to live the way that Jesus would want me to live. Howard's Rock gives each player familiar focus before the game. I've spoken to several of you recently at home gatherings, and I believe Westminster provides a similar focus in your lives. One new member became unexpectedly hospitalized just three days after joining the church. Sudi went out of her way to visit him at the hospital on her way home. That really touched this member and his wife and confirmed to them that they'd made the right choice in joining our church family here at Westminster. Others have told of the lives of their children being changed by going on youth mission trips to Guatemala. There are many other examples but I'm being held to a strict word count today. <laughs> now, there are other parallels between Clemson's football program and Westminster. The tradition that includes rubbing the rock has been labeled the most exciting 25 seconds in college football by <laughs> former broadcaster Brent Musburger. For me, the most exciting 25 seconds in Westminster every week is passing the piece. I also see some similarities between Coach Dabo Sweeney and Greg. From the beginning, he should have been here today. From the beginning when he took over nine years ago, Dabo worked hard to build a family atmosphere for the football program. 
He focuses on developing his players to become change agents, urging them to use the special skills and the platform that they have as athletes to help others. One of his former players is Deshaun Watson. You may have seen him win the national championship last year with Clemson. Right now, he's the quarterback for the Houston Texans in the National Football League. Watson grew up in poverty in Georgia, but he benefited from the help of others via Habitat for Humanity Home. Recently, Deshaun Watson donated his first paycheck to three cafeteria workers in Houston at the stadium there who lost everything that they had in the floods following the hurricane. I believe that Greg and his staff have worked to build a wonderful church family here at Westminster and are urging us to be change agents as well. Whether it's teaching church school, mentoring inner city youth, or building our personal relationship with the Lord by donating to our annual stewardship campaign. In closing, I'll leave you with one more thought. One of Coach Sweeney's favorite phrases is being all in. He wants everybody on the team to be fully immersed in the goals of the team, supporting each other and loving each other. My wife, Melissa, and I were married here at the church. Our two children, Rick and Lauren, were baptized and confirmed here. And we've been involved in numerous activities and held numerous positions over almost 30 years here. We're all in for Westminster, and I'd urge you to be as well. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 8. And this is a passage that Greg preached on recently in a sermon this summer, and it really spoke to me. In the eight years I have been a member here at Westminster, I have felt this wind of the Holy Spirit on many occasions. My husband Sean and I revel as we watch the Holy Spirit swirl around our children, Baden and Evelyn, as they play cello at the Christmas Eve service and participate in the musicals. When we pack the Christmas boxes and fill the backpacks. And when the kids, kids insist on coming back to church on Sunday evenings for the 180 youth program to have fellowship with their friends and to play manhunt in every square inch of this magnificent building. <laughs> I felt the Holy Spirit at work when I agreed to serve on the committee to find our new associate pastor. It was a long two years and it had its ups and downs for sure. But it was an extremely rewarding experience, and I learned so much about this church. It strengthened my church friendships, and of course, we got Sudi. <laughs> and then, on what I was expecting to be just an ordinary Sunday morning, this wind of the Holy Spirit showed up again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. That morning, it blew me behind my back, pushing me down the hallway after church and into community hall, somehow urging me over to this table where this lady I had never met before was selling water filters for Guatemala. <laughs> before I knew what had come over me, I had written a check for $100 to purchase a filter and signed up to go on the next trip. That woman of cat, course, was Kathy Higgins. And even though it felt totally right, I must admit, I did way, lay awake at bed that night before going on my first trip thinking, what on earth am I doing? I have a husband and two young children at home. Is this really necessary? But obviously, the Holy Spirit seemed to think so. Fast forward a few years, and this light breeze of the Holy Spirit has somehow turned into more of a tornado, sucking me into a Guatemalan vortex of projects, PowerPoint presentations, wonderful friendships, and of course, more trips. Last year, the Holy Spirit showed up with hurricane force winds 
on the day that Kathy and I looked at each other and nonchalantly said, hey, let's take the high schoolers to Guatemala. And again, I found myself laying in bed the night before our departure, thinking, what on earth are we doing? But by this time, even though I was still a little apprehensive, I had begun to learn to have faith in this Holy Spirit, to go with the flow and trust the process, because it all seems to work out just fine. And boy, did it. That youth trip was beyond what any of us ever could have expected. Now I understand the Holy Spirit works in all of our lives at different times and at different places. It does not always happen right here at church. However, I am convinced that this wind does blow a bit stronger within these walls and within this church family. And being part of such a strong church community gives us the insight to notice the breeze, the courage to respond to it, the tools to work with it, and the support of other people just to go with it. I hope you have felt a wind in this place. I know I have. As the testimonies of Janet and Craig and Carrie demonstrate, many of us have found blessing in this place. This community centers us and nurtures us and shapes us as disciples. It challenges us to live out the teachings of Christ in our daily lives and encourages us to respond to the mysterious stirrings of the Holy Spirit. Some of us call Westminster home because the fellowship sustains us and the community lifts us up when the burdens of life become too much to bear. Some of us return week after week because the sanctuary is the place we find comfort and peace in the midst of a stressful, even chaotic world. Perhaps this place has formed and transformed you and you trust it will do the same for your children or it has inspired you to take risks for the sake of the gospel and led you to deeper expressions of faith. Perhaps Westminster means so much to you because you have experienced the fullness of God's love and grace made known right here in this, the body of Christ. We have found blessing in this place, and now we are called to share this blessing with others to participate in God's vision of well-being for all the world. This is what it means to be heirs of the promise. Like Abram and Sarai before us, we respond to God's call with faith, with hope, and with gratitude. We respond by giving generously of our time, our talent, and our treasure so that this community of faith may continue to be a blessing to others a gentle and constant tide of God's love rippling out from this corner through our neighborhood, our city, and throughout the world. God calls each of us, just as God called our ancestors of the faith, go, and I will bless you, so that you will be a blessing. I ask you, how will you bear God's blessing to the world?